Welcome, everyone, to a special short edition of Philosophy Bakes Bread, which we call a breadcrumb. Crumble, crumble. <laughs> Philosophy Bakes Bread is a production of the Society of Philosophers in America. In our breadcrumb episodes, we include snippets from past episodes or more substantive responses to your feedback that we received on Twitter at Philosophy BB, Facebook at Philosophy Bakes Bread, or by email at Philosophy Bakes Bread at gmail.com. That's right. Today we've got an exciting breadcrumb episode for you titled Adams, Immigrants, and Race. Eric and I are very fortunate today be, to be joined again by Dr. Marilyn Fisher. Welcome back, Marilyn. Thank you. Glad to be here. Oh, we are super awesome. excited about it. For those who need a, a slight refresher, Dr. Fisher is Professor Emerita at the University of Dayton, and she specializes in political philosophy and American pragmatism. Marilyn was our guest on episode 67 of the show, titled On Jane Addams and Dem Democratic Activism. So, once again, thank you for joining us. Glad to yeah. be here. So, indeed, we're very fortunate to have Marilyn here with us again. And we're very fortunate also to have some very rich feedback from Dr. Vance Ricks of Guilford College about episode 67, as you know, Marilyn. And we're so eager to have you talk about, uh, about this feedback we received. Folks who want to know more about Marilyn, be sure to listen to episode 67 in, in the podcast. And although that episode was fairly recently released in July of this year, it is already in the top 20 most downloaded episodes of all 74 we've released so far. That's kind of a big deal to us anyway. So that's exciting. You're popular, Marilyn. I'm excited. Uh, people, yeah. People are very excited to hear from you, Marilyn. So our plan for this little breadcrumb conversation, we're going to listen to Dr. Rick's voicemail together and then invite you to respond. Sound good? I'm ready. Let's do it. Yeah. So we often ask guests to summarize what the, their episodes were about, but in this case, Dr. Ricks very kindly does that for us in his voicemail, I thought. And so let's hear it from him. Here we go. Here is Dr. Vance Ricks' voicemail. Hello, this is Vance Ricks. I'm a listener to your podcast from North Carolina. I'm calling with a comment about episode 67 with Dr. Marilyn Fisher on the topic of Jane Addams and democratic activism. I thought it was a good discussion and a good introduction to some of the main strands of Adam's life and political engagement. The discussion, I think, also emphasized her open-mindedness and open-heartedness towards immigrants from various parts of Europe. What I missed, though, is a discussion about her attitudes towards black Americans or immigrants or, for that matter, citizens from other parts of the globe than various parts of Europe. I know your time was limited, and there's a whole World Wide Web where I can look up that information. I know, for example, that she and W.E.B. Du Bois were acquainted, but it seemed like a glaring omission from what was an otherwise good discussion, particularly given the fact that Adams lived in a city that now, if not also when she was in her prime, has many black and brown residents. Thanks for the show. Thanks for the discussion. And thanks for taking this message. Goodbye. Well, thank you so much, Vance, for your great yes. voicemail. Thanks, Vance. That was, that was very thoughtful. Indeed. So, so Marilyn. What do you think? Excellent question. Well worth going into. And I think the way to approach it is to talk about maps. Demographic uh -huh. map of Chicago around in the early 20th century when Adams was active at Hull House. The map of patterns of immigration between, say, 1880s and World War I. And then also, let's call it a conceptual map of the assumed racial hierarchy at the time. And all of these have to be readjusted to answer his question. Now, it may be surprising, but when Adams founded Hull House, the population of African Americans in Chicago was only 1.3%. In 1910, huh. 20 years later, only 2% of the citizens of Chicago were African American. And this was pretty typical for cities in the Northeast. At this time, 90% of all African Americans lived in the South, and the migrations of African Americans to the northern cities had not yet begun. That didn't start until during World War I and then continued in the 1920s and beyond. So the first answer is there simply weren't very many African Americans in Chicago at the time. Now, as was also typical for northwestern, northeastern cities at the time, when Hull House was founded, 78% of the population was made up of immigrants and their children. Now, this may sound wow. astonishing, 
The that point is, is, is it does. yeah, seventy eight percent. But look at it this way: if you can keep the numbers straight, in eighteen eighty, the population of Chicago was five hundred thousand. In the next ten years, it doubled to a million. In the wow. next twenty years, it doubled again to two million. Now, who were all these people? Most <laughs> of them were immigrants, and most of them were immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, from Italy, Greece, and a number of Slavic nations. All right. Now, when Adams was living in Chicago before World War I, African Americans lived in more concentrated areas on the south side of Chicago, as they still do, but the city was not as tightly segregated as it became later on. Quick note, he also asked about brown people. Many Mexican immigrants came to Chicago, but not until the 1920s. And when Mexicans and African Americans came in greater numbers, Hull House did serve both of them. Now, let me point to, to some of Adams' many interactions with African Americans in spite of the low numbers at the time. Settlements were supposed to be neighborhood houses to serve their immediate neighborhood. And mm -hmm. After Adams started Hull House, many other settlements sprung up around Chicago. And she helped to set up a number of settlements in areas to serve African-American populations. One was called the Frederick Douglass House. One was called the Wendell Phillips House. And one of the most interesting was run by Reverend E. Ransom. Now, he was an AME preacher assigned to Bethel, Bethel AME Church. And she worked with him on a lot of things. He wanted to start... And, and Marilyn, for, for those who are unaware, AME stands for? American Methodist Episcopalian, I believe. Does Thank that you. Sound, sound right? I think it does. Okay. Reverend e. Ransom so, wanted to set up his church as a social settlement. He did. He got a lot of pushback from other African-American ministers who thought he should only preach the gospel and not get into this social service business. Huh. But Adams helped him, particularly with fundraising, which was the big problem. She, some other important people in Chicago, yes, as Dr. Ricks mentioned, she worked often with W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the leading civil rights people of the era and a leading academic. He often was in Chicago. He stayed at Hull House. They often shared the stage at rallies and public events where they both spoke. Uh -huh. uh, Du Bois ran a series of conferences on African-American life at Atlanta University. He invited Adams to come down and participate in that. Now, now, now Mar Marilyn, for, for our listeners who are unaware, am I correct in remembering that W.E.B. Du Bois might have been the first African-American PhD graduate from Harvard? Isn't that correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. I do. I, I can verify it. Close to it. Yes. Yeah, right. Now, he was one of the founders of the NAACP, as mm -hmm. was Adams. They worked together on that. When Chicago sent up, set up its own branch of the local NAACP, she was on the executive committee and helped to run major conferences for the NAACP in Chicago. Mm -hmm. well, one more acronym. Most people do know this one, but the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was, the, was right. that one, right? Yes. She also worked frequently with Ida B. Wells. And Ida B. Wells is best is known right? as the journalist who did a lot of work investigating lynchings and a lot of anti-lynching mm -hmm. journalism. Mm -hmm. Wells lived in Chicago, and a couple of events in specifically, Adams and Wells spoke together at anti-lynching protests, and there was mm -hmm. a move to segregate the Chicago public schools. And they together fought attempts to do that. Really? Let me mention two events that involve an interesting term. And that term is social equality. Now, mm -hmm. among whites, the notion of social equality was about the worst possible thing you could support. There were a number of whites who were okay with African Americans having political equality. But never, never should African Americans appear as equals on social occasions. Mm. Now, the women's club movement was huge at the time, and it was an interesting movement. There were women's clubs all over the country, primarily middle class, but not entirely. And they were in part social clubs, 
They were in large part educational clubs when women could not go to college very much. And they were also very active in various kinds of social reform. Now, most members of the white women's clubs were not interested in African-American members. Mm. So African-American women started the National Association of Colored Women, their own group, parallel to that. When they held their first convention in Chicago in 1899, Adams invited the women from the National Association of Colored Women to have lunch at Hull House. Uh And that Uh brought up a firestorm. The idea that she would actually invite black women in a purely social event was about the worst thing she could have done. Later on in Memphis, she did the same sort of thing. She was there visiting a number of women's clubs. And she had lunch with 12 African-American club women. Sounds pretty innocuous, right? Sure. But white women were incensed. This was all over the newspaper. That she would eat with them and then come meet with the white women was an insult they did not ever have to want to go through again. Uh Uh-huh. There was that. And one other, how, did, how, did, how did Adams respond to these critiques? Do we know, like, does she say anything or was she just kind of ignore it? Or? Uh, I don't know the answer to the, to the Memphis incident. That was, I just got that from a little newspaper clipping. The other one, I don't know specifically. Depending on the circumstance, she would sometimes stand up for what she had done. Other times brush it off as just time to go on. Not okay. giving someone's critique the time of day because it right. doesn't deserve right. it. That's what I was wondering. I was wondering how she. Well, it's, you know, it, I think it's important to put into a frame of reference here the fact that in the last 10 years, I can recount stories from two American churches where members of the churches were African American and not allowed to marry in those churches. Mm. And this is in, literally in the last 10 years. Really? I will put those in the show notes for this episode, yeah. by the way. Wow. Do that. Yeah. Wow. yeah, I mean, like, like you know, people around the world spat out their coffee is what I told my students when I talked about that in classes. Uh-huh. You know, you got to understand what this looks like to the world. They can't believe it, you know, yeah. at this point. Yeah, but well, people were fine with blacks and whites eating together as long as the African Americans were serving the whites. So it wasn't Ooh. being in the same room at the same time. It was were they oh, meeting man. as social equals or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Just one other wow. quick one. 1915, sure. Birth of a Nation. Remember that movie? Oh, it was the big Ku Klux Klan movie. Well, right. and it got lots of attention and people loved it. White people loved it. And, and it's credited with sort of being one of the big inspirations for the growth and popularity of the Klan right. at that point in time. Right. And and t- just as a, as a quick sort of background for listeners, you've got you got white men in blackface acting as if they were black or pretending to, and sort of you know looking sort of villainous, like they wanted the white women and all this, and they wanted power. And here comes riding in the Ku Klux Klan on horses with trumpets going, and and they're going to keep those people out from the voting you know voting booths, and 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 that's sort of the celebration mm-hmm. at the end of the movie, right? Right. And it's it's right. horrifying. Or I, say, I, have, I have never seen Birth of a Nation. It, okay. Believe it or not, it was very influential <laughs> cinematographically to for the future of film, but the subject matter is pretty horrifying. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Case, so, Marilyn, yeah. you, were, you were talking about the movie. Yeah, yeah. So, Adam saw it in New York City, one of the early showings, and she quickly put out a very strongly worded condemnation to the press, calling it a pernicious uh-huh. caricature of the Negro race, and that you uh-huh. could take the worst white people and make them look just the same way. She mm-hmm. really went after it. Then during the, after World War I and in the 1920s, she continued speaking out on issues of race. Again, it was more episodic because then her principal interest was in issues of international peace. Mm-hmm. So that's the basic picture of Adam's interactions with African-Americans. I mean, so so arguably, it sounds like she had quite a few sorts of interactions and contributions, despite a pretty low population in Chicago at the time. Right, right, that's right. And there were others. And, and- um, in at Hull House, a lot of people trained to do settlement work, including a number of African Americans, came through and did that. Mm-hmm. So she did things, but you're right because of the demographics of the city the possibility of doing that exclusively was was not great. 
Right. And it also sounds like her work kind of was, was a natural extension of her, the philosophy that was already driving her to, exactly. to work with the whole house and immigrants. Exactly. Exactly. And she Very had many, many friends in the African-American community. Again, we could name individuals, but that is the, where it was for the most part. Very interesting. Very interesting. Any final thought you want to leave us with about Dr. Rick's feedback? He also asked about immigrants from places other than Southeastern Europe. Yes. And here, I think we need to talk about immigration patterns because they change over the time. In the mid 19th century, the mid 1800s, immigrants came primarily from Northwestern Europe, Britain, Germany, Scandinavia, some Irish. Now, at this time, there were a large number of people from China coming to the West Coast, and white Americans viewed that as so threatening to the American way of life that the very first restriction on immigration was in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which said, basically, Chinese cannot immigrate except for very small classes could come. Wow. So that meant, okay, that's it for Asia. In the 1890s, there was a huge shift to away from Northwestern Europe and toward Southern and Eastern Europe. There were small numbers from what are now Turkey and Syria. Some of them lived in the Hull House neighborhood. Adams mentions them periodically. You have to look at what immigration scholars called, call push and pull factors. Pushing, what were factors pushing the immigrants to the United States? Mm-hmm. In Europe mm-hmm. at the time, there was famine a lot of political repression, and there were ways to get there. That's where the steamships went to Europe and Mm -hmm. over here. There was also a huge need for labor in the United States as industrial factories were being set up in very rapid numbers. And so labor agents would be stationed all throughout Southeastern Europe, doing all sorts of things to get immigrants to come from there. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I mentioned a conceptual racial map. At the time, Mm -hmm. people did not identify as white. They identified as Mm Anglo-Saxon. And so people from Northwestern Europe, they kind of mushed the Germans in with the British and so on to be Anglo-Saxon, saw themselves as racially superior to Italians, Greeks, Polish people, and others from Eastern Europe. And so you had this hierarchy of the races where people from Southern and Eastern Europe were considered in the racial hierarchy above people of African descent. But it was, again, a range. It was not a stark white-black question. And at the time, the real question about what threatened the country was in terms of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. That was the big bugaboo. Those are the people pouring into the cities. It was those Italians, huh? Exactly, exactly. They were bringing <laughs> my, crime. My grandparents? Yep. Yeah, like, cash, like cashiers. <laughs> yes, you're right. Ask If you have any old, old relatives around, ask them for stories. Oh, I've, I've got stories, yeah. Okay, yeah, then you know what I mean. Them, yeah. yeah. And again, they grew up Italian Catholic in the South. In oh, the South, oh, South. oh. In the South, yeah. Italians yep. were lynched, and they were generally yep. really? associated with African Americans. Yes, oh, yeah. I oh, didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. The big date, which I wish everybody knew, is 1924. And uh-huh. this was the... F- All right, everyone, write this down. 1924, the Johnson-Reed Act. There was okay. so much hysteria about immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe ruining the country that the government passed this act, which for the first time made systematic restrictions on immigrants, targeting specifically Southeastern Europe and Asia. Asians were completely restricted. Southeastern Europeans were restricted to tiny, tiny percentages of what had been coming in. And so if you ask, why was America so white until 1965? It's because of the Johnson-Reed Act. Now, after that happened, that's when African Americans and Mexicans in large numbers started moving into northern cities because the factories needed the labor. They had lost their uh-huh. labor source. And they, yeah, they couldn't recruit the cheap. Right. Uh-huh. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Now, So this as, is the push and pull point, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. And so the question about, and that, that was not lifted till 1965. Really? Yeah. 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 All right. 
So when he asks about immigrants from other parts of the globe, the easy answer is there weren't very many. And they weren't in northeast cities in the northeast, like Chicago, New York, and so on. A legal wall, so to speak. Exactly. Exactly. A huge wall. All right. And Adams fought against the Johnson-Reed Act. She fought against many, many immigration restriction acts and lost. So is that good for that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I feel like I learned a ton and I'm going to have to do some research to do the show notes to make sure. (laughs) Thanks, Baron. I, 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 you know, I've learned a lot more about Jane Adams, who's becoming one of my favorite Americans ever. (laughs) And then, you know, just about American history just right now, a little breadcrumb. It's super informative. Yeah. So thank you. You know, and, and I think it's it helps to be reminded something, which is which is that the, you know, there was there was definitely news about lynchings, but you know we didn't have the instantaneous news and photographs that we have now. You know what I mean? And and it was it was harder to be aware of things than than they are than it is today. Well, you know the answer I mean? and, to and, that and is yet she was the answer to that is yes and no. Oh, really? Because okay. newspapers they had telegraphs then. And sure. newspapers okay. would get the news the next day, and some newspapers put out multiple editions, and there were far more newspapers. Every oh, interesting. Every immigrant group in Chicago had its own foreign language newspaper. So uh-huh. the news got around, and there were quite a number of African-American newspapers. The Chicago Defender was the big one in Chicago. Uh-huh. So okay. no, it wasn't like checking your your phone every 10 minutes to see the latest, but it was quick. right. Well, I, I, what I, I guess I can add to what I was saying though, is that um, some people point to changes with regard to civil rights, having to do with photographers going yes. to the South, because yes. when you hear about something that's very different, hearing about a lynching in the abstract is one thing, actually seeing a charred hanging body is devastating, right? Like, you know, some things in the abstract are, are less, I mean, they, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? It's, it's, it's also can be gut-wrenching to see a picture. Let you know me, I mean? let and, me and complicate that statement. Okay, okay. In the South, lynchings were big community parties. The town uh-huh. came yeah, out to true. watch. They brought their picnics. They brought the kids. Okay. They took photographs. There were yeah. postcards of people being lynched that were just widely, <gasps> widely available. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I yeah mean, they go, you, the pictures of lynchings, yeah, they were around. There, there are some. photos at lynchings. Well, That's they how were around and they wow. were easily obtainable. Now, it wow. is true that by the 60s, you had television. And so there you had people uh-huh. sitting down and watching moving pictures of what was being done to people. And I think that made a difference, too. <sighs> wow. Well, it does complicate the picture. We do want to hold these folks to, you know, the, you know, we don't want to treat them like saints when, when they're not, right? But on right. the other hand, you know, you've pointed to quite a few things that Adams did in her, t- in her day. So yep. I really appreciate that. That's something to chew on. You know, nobody's a saint, right? But Adams is pretty impressive, it seems to me. And She did a whole yeah. lot at the time. Right. And, and thank you so much for helping us to paint a, a fuller picture. Marilyn. Yes, you're yeah, welcome. Thanks, Marilyn. Yeah, we, happy we to do have it. To have you back on for another episode. I think we could do one on uh, where, where, where the idea of whiteness came from. I think that's a oh, good that episode. has a history. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. In yeah. fact, there's a couple of people I'm thinking of who'd be great to have on about that. Yeah, well, well, we could even do a little panel about that. Indeed. Part yeah, well, uh, thanks again, Marilyn, for joining us. I, I, I was saying earlier, I've learned so much from this little conversation. I hope everyone has also learned a, a lot and has enjoyed this little breadcrumb. Yeah. Remember, everyone, that you can call us and leave a short recorded message with a question or a comment that we may be able to play on the show, as you just heard today, at 859-257-1849. You can also catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and on email. For any of that information, again, visit philosophybakesbread.com. This is Anthony Cascio, and I'm here today with Eric Weber and Marilyn Fisher, and you have been listening to Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership.